Welcome everyone uh, to this evening's event. Uh, this evening's lecture is titled N4, N15, Sligo Urban Improvement Scheme. We are delighted that you can join us. This evening's lecture is presented by the Northwest Region and the Roads and Transportation Society. So um, just a, one uh, housekeeping, uh, just for housekeeping, uh, we have a Q&A session at the end. Uh, and just make sure you can add the questions into the Q&A facility and not, not the chat box. So without further ado, I'd like to hand you over now to your speaker for this evening, Kevin Crawley. Kevin, over to you. Okay, thank you, Ian, and good evening, all. So the presentation this evening will give an overview of the development, design, and ultimately delivery of the N4 and 15 Sligo Urban Improvement Scheme. So those joining uh, tonight who aren't familiar with the scheme, or indeed Sligo itself, the scheme has a relatively modest footprint when compared to other large interurban national road schemes which have been built around the country. However, the N4 and 15 scheme, with its location in the heart of Sligo and at the confluence of the N4, N15 and N16 national primary roads, posed some significant challenges both during the design phase and indeed the construction phase. So we just concentrate on the project location at the moment and you'll see at the top uh, left corner of the screen here, you can see the scheme extends is right in the middle of the urban centre of Sligo on the main artery into and out of it. And in terms of lands made available ultimately for the works, uh, now you'll know what the drawing isn't to true north, but we have Hughes's Bridge located at this location here. And you'll see that all lands to the north of Hughes's Bridge were required for the widening and online realigning of the uh, N4 and 15 corridor, with all lands to the south of Hughes's Bridge being required for the provision and installation of an urban traffic control system. So the project was developed in accordance with the Transport Infrastructure Ireland's project management guidelines, and there's eight phases in total, with phases zero to four being for planning and design, and phases five to seven being for construction and implementation. The scheme is currently at phase seven, closeout and review. So just in terms of the scheme history and development, and if we just take a step back in time and consider the Sligo approach roads up to the mid-1980s. And so if you look at the map on the screen, uh, you'll see that this is a fairly good depiction of what was the status of uh, the approach roads in the mid 80s, with one exception where the N15 uh, New Bundoran Road was constructed uh, sometime in the 1960s. So we can see the N4, unrealigned N4 to the south, we have the regional road coming in from uh, Callery, we have the N16 coming in from Manor Hamilton, and indeed the N15 coming from Donegal, and all roads are leading to the town centre. And just looking at that in more detail, we can see that any vehicles and traffic that wished to cross the Garavog north to south could only do so in the mid-1980s via one of two bridges. Either the Douglas Hyde Bridge, which is located adjacent to what is now the Glasshouse Hotel, or further upstream, New Bridge. So you can appreciate the traffic congestion that would occur in terms of very heavy traffic trying to pass through that town core centre. So in the 70s, there was a number of studies carried out and they identified a third crossing point, which was located at Customs House Quay and across from Salmon Point. So in 1988, we had the opening of the Michael Hughes Bridge and Approach Road Scheme, and this was the first major infrastructural project for Sligo Town itself. It saw the construction of a new bridge with a provision of two lanes in both directions, together with footways, and it also included significant realignment and junction improvement on the northern side of the river. So if we look at the image on the left, and this is a, represents a, a fair representation of what was constructed in the late 80s. So we had Hughes's Bridge here. We had the construction of the N4 Markovich Road Junction, the construction of the N4 N16 Duck Street Junction, and a significant reconfiguration of the N15 R291 Ross's Point Road Junction. And in terms of changes in, in the traffic patterns, instead of all traffic now having to progress through the town core, traffic was now coming down Pierce Road, onto the Mail Coach Road, Temple Street, Adelaide Street, and Union Street, and across Hughes Bridge and away. And while it wasn't the town centre, these are still streets, and so there was uh, still significant congestion even after the construction of Hughes Bridge, especially during peak times. So the next major scheme for Sligo Town was the construction of the N4 Inner Relief Road, and this consists of a dual carriage from Carrow Roundabout to Hughes Bridge. And the construction commenced in quarter one 2004 by Ascon, now BAM, and was completed in quarter three 2005. And it consists of two distinct sections, a rural, a rural dual carriageway of circa 2.8 kilometers, a new roundabout construction at Summerhill College, and then an urban dual carriageway of uh, 1.1 kilometers in length. 
and there was five number traffic signal control junctions provided as part of this urban uh, dual carriage resection, which will become more pertinent later on. So with the construction of the inner relief road, Sligo County Council then approached the NRA in terms of developing the next phase of the N4 and 15 corridor, which consisted of the N4 and 15 Sligo to County boundary scheme. So it consisted of a realignment from Hughes's Bridge all the way out to the Bunduff Bridge on the Leitrim County boundary. And this was progressed through various stages of planning from 2004 right through to 2010. Indeed, a preferred route was adopted and the preliminary design was completed. However, with the financial crisis engulfing the country at that time, the rural section of the scheme was suspended in 2010 and remains suspended to this day as the scheme still has not been included on the National Development Plan. So undeterred, Sligo County Council then went back to the NRA to see if they could look at developing the urban section, which is a realignment from Hughes's Bridge to north of the N15 Scotsman's Walk Junction. It's a length of approximately 1.6 kilometers and again was to be an urban dual carriageway and like the major scheme and the boundary, county boundary scheme, the preliminary design again was completed. However, once again in 2012, Slide County Council were informed that funding wasn't in place to progress the scheme any further. So Sligo County Council went back for a third bite to the cherry and went to the NRA in relation to the N4 Traffic Improvement Scheme, aka the Hughes Bridge Widening Scheme. So thankfully, the NRA gave approval and construction commenced in October 2014 by Ellen Keating and was completed in August 2015. It saw the provision of two new footbridges, cantilevered on each side of the existing bridge, the removal of the existing footways from the main bridge deck, and the provision of three lanes in both directions across the bridge. And this had immediate benefits for southbound traffic in particular, as it saw the addition of a right turning lane for southbound traffic wishing to access Ballast Quay and Guan into Finskland Industrial Park. However, the benefits for northbound traffic were much more limited as the third northbound lane was closed for future road development. It had nowhere for it to go. So if we consider Sligo County Council's wish of uh, progressing the N4 and 15 corridor from Hughes's Bridge all the way up to Scotsman's Walk, the N4 traffic improvement scheme represented phase one of this overall goal. So with the construction of the N4 traffic improvement scheme uh, well underway in 2015, uh, Sligo County Council uh, once again approached uh, the NRA, which was now the TAI after the merger of the Railroad Procurement Agency, to see could they progress phase two. So what were the existing conditions on phase two? So the section from Hughes's Bridge, the N15 or 291 junction. Well, this road section consists of the confluence of the N4, N15 and N16 national primary roads and has an AADT annual average daily traffic of approximately 26,000 vehicles. This makes it one of the busiest sections of road in Connacht outside of Galway city. The route itself forms part of the Atlantic Economic Corridor and com comprehensive 10T network. And it consisted of an urban two lane dual carriageway with a 50 kilometer speed limit. There was short sections of right turning lanes provided at the three signalized control junctions. Um, however, these provided insufficient stacking for right turners, which in turn led to traffic congestion along the inner relief road. As discussed a few moments ago, the third lane over North Brown Bridge remained closed and there was a distinct lack of vulnerable road user infrastructure in particular for cyclists. There was also significant safety issues and a collision history. So there was 18 collisions over the period 2005-2013, uh, with the majority of these occurring at the N4 and 16 junction. So this resulted in a collision rate twice above the expected uh, national average for a similar road type. And interestingly, pedestrian accidents, accidents accounted for circa 15% of all collisions. There was also an issue in terms of the inefficient traffic and signal control uh, technology along this section of road and indeed the N4 in a relief road to the south. So the existing traffic signals and controllers along this road section, um, uh, together with the N4 in a relief road and adjacent local regional road network were coordinated by cableless linking and signal timings had been individually set by Sligo County Council's road department based on experience and delays at each junction. And even though this existing system incorporated modern controllers and included dial-up remote monitoring back to a centralized monitoring computer, the system did not have the capability of automatically responding to changes in traffic demand, so to ensure uh, traffic flows were optimized. So thankfully, TAI gave approval to progress the scheme and the design of the N4 and 15 uh, Sligo Urban Improvement Scheme commenced in early 2016. It was managed by Sligo's National Roads Project Office, which is now the Sligo Regional Design Office, and Jacobs Engineering Ireland Limited were appointed as the technical consultants for phases three to seven. Initially, the project was consist of two distinct and separate elements. 
The first being the main civil works contract from Hughes's Bridge to North the N50 North 291 Junction. And the second being the installation of an urban traffic control system along the entire relief road from N4 John Street to the N50 North 291 Junction. And the reason for the separation at that time was that it was felt that um, the UTC contract would be better served having a more uh, technical specialist in terms of UTC driving it. And also that there would be limited civil works required around the town to facilitate the installation of the UTC system. The combined main objectives of the scheme was to improve capacity of the road network to cater for existing and future road traffic, and also to improve road safety and reduce accidents. The scheme being in an urban location and with 50 kilometer speed limit was to be designed to the design, design manual for urban roads and streets. And the carriage or cross section was to consist of a multi carriageway arterial road in a boulevard configuration. So the first step that Jacobs had to do as designers was to develop a traffic model for the whole of Sligo town. So they looked at the TI permanent traffic counters and the, um, the National Transport Authority's count database. They commissioned junction turning counts, pedestrian surveys, journey time surveys, and they took a three strand approach to modeling. The first being the development of Sligo area macro traffic model using Saturn. And they also looked at and developed an N4 corridor micro traffic model using uh, s -Paramics. And you can see the image above is an output from the s -Paramics system. And it shows the individual vehicles and the queuing back that can occur under different scenarios. The third um, element of the modeling was the use of TUBA, Transport user Users Benefit Appraisal, for the economic appraisal. So we're talking here about tra travel times and vehicular operating costs. So in terms of the alternatives that were uh, considered as part of the design, so we had the do nothing, which speaks for itself. We had a do minimum, which, in which at the time assumed that the Eastern Garvo Bridge would be constructed prior to the construction of the N4 and 15 Sligo Urban Improvement Scheme. And we had three do something alternatives each with the same main line central line alignment, but with variations on a team between left slips in and out of the three traffic signal control junctions. So moving on to phase three, the preliminary design, and just in terms of the design issues and the constraints on site. So the first ones are environment constraints. The scheme is located directly adjacent to, and indeed straddles the Cumming Strand, Drumcliff Bay, Special Area Conservation, Special Protection Area, and National Heritage Area. And the qualifying interest uh, at the location adjacent to N4 and 15 is habitat mud flat and sand flat habitat. And if you see the photo on the right, you can see this uh, mud flat and sand flat habitat is clearly exposed in low tide. There was also significant land space and in turn geometric design constraints. Because again, if we wanted to widen the existing dual carriageway, we were going to have to by necessity encroach onto the foreshore and provide retaining walls to retain that against the, uh, the sea. On the west, on the eastern side, apologies, uh, we also had the HSC's campus, consisted of Markvich House, a uh, care dock facility, and significant internal access roads and car parking arrangements. So we had to be very, very careful on the amount of land that was taken as part of a CPO uh, to ensure that there was no detrimental impacts on the operation of the facility. In terms of constructability, this scheme had the potential to bring Sligo to a halt during the construction phase. So the designers had to carefully look at traffic management plans, phasing of structures, you know, and just ensure that the actual scheme was buildable in the first instance. We were also aware of significant existing utility infrastructure on site. So we're talking air, ESB, ENET, Virgin, and significant Irish water assets. We were also aware that we had invasive alien plant species on site, consisting of small stands of Japanese knotweed located on the northern end of the site on lands which were to be CPO'd. So we had to take into account advanced treatment measures and indeed measures that would have to be incorporated as the main construction contract to fully eradicate the Japanese knotweed. And we also had to consider water quality impacts. So if we look at the image uh, here, just on the bottom of the screen, this represents uh, an extract from the preliminary design drawings, and it shows the various different drainage catchments and subcatchments. So we had three outfalls, uh, one into the Gar of Og and two into the Copper River. So we use the Highways Agency Water Risk Assessment Tool uh, to carry out the water quality impact. And when the outfalls were assessed individually, there was no issues all passed. However, you're also required to carry out a cumulative assessment and the cumulative assessment on the Copper River ended up in a failure. And ironically, it was a failure because the uh, Horrod tool predicted that there will be too much soluble copper, which is emanating from the exhaust of cars being picked up in surface water and being discharged to the Copper River itself which I just kind of found very, very coincidental. 
So the upshot was we required attenuation treatment pond for the northern drainage networks. And you can see this was the location identified and it just provided a further land constraint and land requirement on an area where we were, you know, where land was at a premium. So a significant constraint also was the existence of the Rackwater Bridge Copper River culvert on site. And this is located between the N4 and 16 Duck Street Junction and indeed the N15 or 291 Junction. And you can see from the photo here, it's a hybrid arrangement. We have a masonry arch bridge section just here. We have an upstream chamber, and then we have two 1.6 meter diameter corrugated pipes. And we believe this widening of the masonry arch structure was carried out in the 1960s as part of the new Bundoran Road construction. If we look at the uh, facade on the downstream side, we see there's extensive stonework each side of the openings. And indeed, the openings themselves are rectangular, which is quite unusual on a masonry arch structure. In, if you look carefully, you can actually see the arches above the actual rectangular openings themselves. Likewise, the obverts of the rectangular openings are actually lower than the top of the arches. And in turn, we can see um, the old hinges that were used to hold the tidal flaps that was on this structure in the past. So with the tidal flaps gone, the upstream side of the Copper River is now subject to tidal surges at high tide. A condition survey on the bridge identified the significant repointing will be required in the arch barrels themselves, as you can see from this photo, with uh, just lots of washouts shown. And we'd also have to carry out repairs on the upstream face of the masonry arch structure. So you can see here, we've dropped keystones and a number of stones missing. We can see actually the upstream chamber itself consisting of a concrete wall in the middle and some masonry on each side. And in the foreground, we have our corrugated pipe. And then lastly, in terms of structure, we see we have two uh, upstream metal grills just preventing debris going into the structure itself. So at preliminary design, there was a number of options considered to how we would deal with this structure. The first option was for the total demolition of the structure and the replacement of a new structure and um, extension on the upstream side using a new precast uh, box culvert of six meters in width and three and a half meters in height, with a half meter embedment with a granular material to satisfy Inland Fisheries Ireland's requirements. However, this caused a particular difficulty because there was a number of utilities passing over the masonry arches at this location, including a 450 uh, diameter combined sewer. And so the only way we'd resolve uh, the utility uh, difficulty would be we'd have to provide either an inverted siphon for the, uh, the combined sewer, or we'd have to provide a short section of pumped rising main. And neither of these approaches was agreeable by either Sligo County Council's water services or indeed Irish water. So on that basis, option one just was discounted. So the second option again was the full demolition of the structure itself and the provision of a smaller box culvert, six meters in width by 1.8 meters in height with a half meter embedment. And this was brought forward for appraisal. And then the third option consisted of retaining of the masonry art structure as shown in the blue line here, demolition of the upstream chamber as shown in the yellow line and also demolition of the two 1.6 meter diameter corrugated pipes as shown in the red line. And the upstream chamber and the corrugated pipes will be replaced by a box culvert similar to that proposed under option one. So six meters wide by 3.5 meters high. In terms of the extension required on the upstream to facilitate the new screen, or, uh, the new uh, roads, apologies, the, this is approximately 16 meters in length. So it goes from where the existing uh, upstream face of the structure was to approximately this location here. And you'll see we're also providing a brand new steel screen to prevent more debris going into and getting caught at the masonry arches. So when the options uh, were appraised, it was option number three, the retention of the masonry arch structure, which won out. So just looking at this in section, again, we have our masonry arch structure here with our uh, two, twin arch, two twin barrels, and it's highlighted in blue the location where our upstream chamber was, and indeed, again, where our corrugated pipes were. So you can see, again, on the upstream side, we were going to put in this colored uh, screen. So with the preliminary design completed, um, we then moved into phase four, environmental assessment and statutory consent. So we had to carry out a screening for appropriate assessment. And obviously with the location of the scheme directly to and straddling the SAC, the development was screened in, which meant that we had to prepare a natural impact statement and indeed an accompanying environmental assessment report. In terms of compulsory purchase order, it required the compulsory purchase of approximately 10 acres of land. 
which varied from uh, commercially zoned lands to roadbed to portions of foreshore and also to lands belonging to the HSE. There was 12 individual landholders impacted. And when the CPO documents and indeed the environmental assessment documents were uh, prepared, they were lodged on board Planola in June 2017. There was one objection to the scheme, and this resulted in the need for an oral hearing, which was held in the Clayton Hotel in November 2017. And thankfully, on board Planola granted approval for the scheme for the NIS and indeed the CPO without modification in February 2018. So this subsequently allowed Sligo County Council to issue the notice to treat in June 2018 and the notice to enter in July 2018. So with statutory consent obtained, we then moved into phase five, uh, which was enabling and procurement. And there was a number of advanced works um, and surveys which had to be carried out. The first of which was an archeological weight and metal detection survey of the Copper River. So basically where the new upstream section of the Copper River culvert was to be sited. So this was carried out by Mizzen Archaeology and no items of archaeological significance uh, were discovered. We also had to carry the advanced treatment of Japanese knotweed infestations. And this was carried out as part of the TI's Invasive Alien Plant Species IEPS annual treatment program. This was carried out by the contractor that was involved in IEPS, the Greentown Environmental Limited, and they carried out a spraying of the Japanese uh, knotweed twice yearly between 2017 to 2019 inclusive. Now, this did not fully eradicate the Japanese knotweed. It severely inhibited the spread and there was significant actual reduction in the volumes. However, we were still required to include requirements in the works requirements for the removal uh, as part of the main construction phase. So under phase five, we then started looking at the detailed design of the urban traffic control system. So I suppose what is an urban traffic control system is the first question. So it's a specialist form of traffic management which consists of a fully adaptive traffic control system which uses data for vehicle detectors and optimizes traffic signal settings to reduce vehicle delays and stops. The system provides a fast response to changes in traffic conditions, thereby allowing the system to respond to variations in traffic demand on a cycle by cycle basis. And the individual traffic signal controllers at each junction are connected back to a designated server room location using a dedicated purpose designed and built fiber optic communications network. So the UTC model traffic detected on street to continuously adapt three key traffic control parameters. The first being the amount of green time for each approach, which is known as the split. The second being the timer between adjacent signals, which is known as the offset. And the third being the time allowed for all approaches to the signalized intersection, which is known as the cycle time. And it is by the continuous adaption of these three parameters, which minimizes wasted green time in intersections and therefore reduces stops and delays by synchronization of adjacent traffic signal installations. Accordingly, the signal timings evolve with the change in traffic situation without any disruption caused by changing fixed time plans. So the system is a smart intelligent transportation system. It reacts to real-time data to make intelligent decisions to optimize traffic flows. And in terms of the benefits of the UTC system, well, obviously it helps reduce travel times which in turn then reduces congestion and likewise reduces fuel consumption and pollution. And the system also has the capability for enacting emergency green waves and bus priority, and indeed priority for other public service vehicles. However, this would require special sensors to be fitted to either the buses or the public vehicles as appropriate. So for Sligo, what were we looking for for the urban traffic control system? So we wanted to roll it out over 13 number junctions or locations, so we're talking from the N4 John Street uh, in a relief road junction, right along heading north up to the N15 or 291 junction, and indeed to a new pedestrian crossing, which we provided just north of the N15 or 291 junction. We also wanted to include five number non-national adjacent side road junctions. So we're talking here about uh, John Street and uh, Adelaide Street, Lord Edward Street and Union Street, Queen Store Road, Wine Street Car Park, and indeed the top of O'Connell Street, because all five of these junctions were deemed to have significant influence on the operation of traffic flows along the inner relief road itself. So we're looking for the most modern and state-of-the-art technology being provided as part of the system. And we're also looking for the provision of a fiber optic communications network. And this fiber optic community tech, uh, technology was to feed into Sligo County Council's Smart City Initiative. So the first thing uh, Jacobs as designers had to do was carry out a survey of existing traffic signal infrastructure right along the inner relief road. And Jacobs have a specialized uh, a traffic signals uh, design team based out of Birmingham in the UK. So they flew over and they inspected every bit of traffic signal infrastructure right along the site. 
And thankfully, we had relatively good news from this survey because while the system was inefficient in terms of coordinating or adapting to change in traffic flow, the actual hardware was of a relatively modern standard that could be easily incorporated into a new UTC system. So we basically didn't have to throw out all the existing equipment that was there. The second step was to carry out a gap analysis of the existing duct network around the town. And initially we would have done this uh, with the help of the local area office. And uh, after a couple of weeks, we realized a mammoth task that was ahead of us. So we went out to tender for a duct survey and this was eventually awarded to Malayan Plant Tire Limited, a local company here in Sligo. And they went on to survey approximately eight kilometers of existing ducts, which were surveyed and roped. And the upshot was, was that we required significant civil works around Sligo Town to be able to make the UTC um, uh, be provided. So you remember earlier, we had two separate schemes. We had the main civil work scheme and then we had the UTC system. So the outcome of the duct network survey was that we would have to combine the main civil works and the UTC works into one overall contract. So with the detailed design complete and all our consultations with the third party utility providers complete, we finalized our requirements uh, for our tender documents. So it was to include the upgrade of 730 meters of the existing N4 and 15 urban dual carriageway. It was to provide seven number designated structures. It was to include drainage, earthworks, diversion of utility services, provision of new Irish water capital infrastructure, which I'll discuss in a few moments, the provision of active travel elements, such as uh, cycleways and footways, the incorporation of urban traffic control system or an intelligent transport system, and also accommodation works and landscaping, including the development of a small urban park at the N15 or 291 junction. So we went out to tender in April 2018, um, and we commenced the first stage of a restricted tender. So those who aren't familiar with public works contracts, we, um, a procurement, uh, we could have gone out with an open tender all in one hit, or we, could, we can do the restricted tender process, whereby the first stage consists of uh, tenderers filling out a suitably assessment questionnaire. And the purpose for this is to determine a contractor's experience, competency, and knowledge. So we were looking for a main contractor, an urban traffic control specialist, an urban traffic control communication specialist for the installation of the fiber optic uh, communications network, and also a masonry repair specialist to carry out the necessary repairs to the masonry art structure at the Copper River Bridge. We received 10 submissions, but ultimately no applicant passed, despite some of these submissions being from a who's who of civil engineering contractors in this country. And we have to hold our hand up here is because we set the bar too high. While not exclusively the reason, a lot of the applications failed due to the requirement for a masonry repair specialist. So we had no option but to, to abandon the tender. So in 2018, we went back out to the market with a, and recommenced the first stage of the restricted tender process with a revised set of SQ uh, criteria. And in these, we did not include a masonry repair specialist. So in January 2019, uh, as part of the SQ, we were able to shortlist five contractors and tenders then issued to these five number shortlist contractors and tenders were received back in March 2019. So with the lowest price tender known to us at this stage, we then had to carry out a post tender appraisal. So all TI projects must comply with the TI's project appraisal guidelines. So this scheme, the N4 and 15, is a minor scheme as it has an overall total scheme budget of less than 20 million. And the phase five deliverables necessary at this stage was the update and preparation of a project appraisal report. Now a project appraisal report is basically a condensed version of a detailed business case, which is used on the larger major schemes. And it incorporates elements such as a project brief, a traffic modeling report, cost benefit analysis, and project appraisal balance sheet. So for the N4 and 15 benefit to cost ratio, as I said earlier, when we we're talking about the traffic modeling, uh, Jacobs were using transport user benefit appraisal software, Tuba. So when the benefit to cost ratio was completed, we worked out at a figure of 1.515, excluding UTC benefits. So that is a very, very good result, showing that the benefits of the scheme exceed the costs involved. And the reason that UTC benefits were initially excluded is because it's very, very hard to quantify what the actual benefits will be. You know, it'll all depend on a site by site basis. So a sensitivity test was carried out, uh, including UTC benefits. So there was assumed benefits of 15% reduction in journey times. And this increased the uh, benefit to cost ratio BCR from 1.515 to 
again, a very good result. So with the project appraisal report and uh, deliverables for the project appraisal guidelines complete, we submitted this along with a tender assessment report, tender award recommendation, updated project execution plan, and updated total scheme budget to GCI as part of a phase five gate review statement, seeking approval to award the contract. So with TI given approval to award the contract, we moved into phase six construction and implementation. So the contract was awarded to Fox Building Engineering Limited on 31st of July, 2019. And the specialists to, that came with Fox Building Engineering Limited included the UTC traffic uh, specialist or UTC specialist, Traffic Solutions Limited, and the UTC Communications Network Specialist, Bandwidth. The project was managed overall by the Sligo Regional Design Office, and the employer's representative and designer, again, was Jacobs Engineering Ireland Limited. The site team provided was provided by Sligo County Council under the leadership of the senior RE, Victor Cooney. And we were also required to uh, provide an environmental insurance officer as part of the conditions of the grant of the statutory consent. And this role was carried out by Woodrow Sustainable Solutions based out of Balisadir. There was a project board for the project. And indeed, we also had a standing conciliator. And it was Hank Fogarty who fulfilled the role of standing conciliator. Unfortunately, Hank has passed away a number of months ago, so I'd like, just like to take this opportunity to pay tribute to, to Hank and to thank him for all his work involved in the scheme. Likewise, we had another member of Sligo County Council staff, Jim Duncan from the Water Services section, who also tragically passed away a number of months ago, and Jim had been an integral part of the liaison from Water Services through both the contractor and the RE on site. So may the boast rest in peace. Okay, so construction commenced in September 2019 and was focused primarily at the northern end of the scheme in around the N15 or 291 junction. So just really now to go through a number of the issues we encountered uh, in terms of the construction phase. So firstly, traffic management. And as you can appreciate, a scheme like this right in the heart of Sligo was always going to be very, very difficult or problematic from a traffic management point of view. We did get lucky because while we were designing the scheme at phase five, we were having to use the old chapter eight. However, as we were going to construction, the transition period between the new chapter eight and the old chapter eight was in play. So this ultimately changed the designation of the section of road from a level five road under the old chapter eight to a level one subcategory four road, which had significant benefits in terms of re relaxations on what was the requirements for TM. Just to kind of give you an idea of the amount of work um, and time that went involved in the traffic management for this scheme, it was 45 number formal traffic management meetings between the Roads Authority, client, contractor and RE staff. So a significant amount of time was involved in the planning and consideration of the traffic management measures implemented on site. There was over 19 individual traffic management plans considered and implemented. And this didn't include ongoing discussions that relates to adjustment of traffic signal timings and phasings at all of the existing traffic signal junctions. We also had significant number of wider stakeholder TM meetings with the Gardaí, Ambulance, Service, Bus, Air and the Fire Service. I suppose just to give you an idea of the complexities of the site and the traffic management we had to employ, I'm just going to play a short video. Okay, so before I press play, we're actually looking south across this huge bridge, and you'll see that in the background, we have two lanes of traffic here being merged into one. So traffic heading northbound along the inner relief road is having to merge down into one lane before it passes through the works. So we're just gonna pan round now and head northbound, and you will see that the structure 02 over here is well underway, which is a retaining wall along the foreshore you'll see that we're actually down to one lane in each direction. And this was a relaxation of the works requirements. And as we'll discuss in a moment, this arose out of reduced traffic volumes because of COVID. You will see on the right that we have a structure 03 along with the HSE, uh, well underway also. And that as we approach the N4 N16 junction, we have a right turn available and the northbound traffic. The amount of traffic streaming from the N16 junction is actually the diverted N15 southbound traffic. This has been diverted approximately two kilometers further north of the scheme itself. You will see that there is a, a lift of the precast units underway and that the first phase of the precast units is in place and a temporary access road has been provided for northbound uh, traffic. We're looking now at the N15 or 291 junction 
And indeed, you can see the attenuation pond, which was actually used as a settlement pond uh, for surface waters during the actual construction of the scheme itself. So you can see there's quite a significant impact in terms of traffic management um, right around the town with the diversions in play. So in the foreground, you'll see the pumps and the, which were used to over pump the Copper River during the damming. And you'll see that the um, contractor is lifting the second phase, the bottom U units here. And then at this location here, you will see the exposed upstream phase of the masonry arch structure. Okay, and we're now looking uh, north uh, northwest along the R29 Ross's Point Road, and see there was significant setback of the existing verge to accommodate, uh, you know, the provision of uh, walls and accommodation works. And again, earthworks are ongoing now along the N15, uh, as we see it, and traffic is actually just just held for a second by a banksman, while dumpers are being allowed into the works area itself. Okay, and just traffic just exiting from the scheme. So I hope that kind of gives you a, an overview of uh, the kind of different process that was going on and the traffic manager that had to be employed um, on the works. And again, this was from July 2020. So obviously, as traffic management was a significant issue uh, on this job, so too was communications with the public. So in terms of the contractor, they provided numerous letter drops to surrounding residents and uh, buildings and commercial properties, and they also had a public liaison officer appointed for the works. In terms of the communications in terms of Slug County Council, we provided weekly report, uh, roads reports in terms of traffic management, which went out to all the local media agencies and indeed uh, councillors and stakeholders. And in addition, we also provided regular traffic management bulletins to stakeholders, so surrounding businesses uh, that um, educational facilities and so on. We provided regular updates through Sligo County Council's social media channels. So we're talking Instagram, Twitter, uh, Facebook. And we also set up a dedicated Sligo County Council webpage for traffic management for the scheme. In addition, we also commissioned a promotional information video to explain to the Sligo public, you know, in terms of the benefits of the scheme, you know, the difficulties encountered in terms of, uh, you know, the construction of the scheme itself. And works were progressing fairly well up uh, in early 2020, you know, contractors' resources and plans were really ramp up, ramping up on site, and we could really see significant progress being made. And then something totally unexpected happened to us, and that was the COVID-19 pandemic. So like all sites in the country, the N4 and 15 site had to close at the end of March in line with government requirements, and it remained closed for seven weeks, so from the end of March to mid-May 2020. And so while we were all at home, getting used to working from home and sticking to our two kilometers and five kilometer uh, zones, uh, we had probably the one thing that kept us sane was we had seven weeks of early summer weather. But for contractors, this signaled that the earthwork season had come early. So not alone were contractors struggling to, you know, implement protocols in terms of COVID compliance, retrofitting vehicles so they can deliver their workforce to site whenever the sites would reopen. They were also seeing very, very early summer weather, which would allow significant earthwork operations to normally uh, underway early in the season. COVID didn't have any real benefits uh, to this country, except maybe one, because it saw a dramatic decrease in traffic, man traffic volumes on the N4 and 15 site. But everyone working at home, the roads, you know, there was very, very little traffic on the road. So when the sites opened in May 2020, um, we were able to offer relaxations to the contract in terms of traffic management requirements and in terms of lane widths and lane available. So this uh, initial uh, reduction in traffic volumes, you know, it lasted for possibly a month, month and a half. And then as the country began to reopen in July, August 2020, we had another phenomenon in that everybody wanted to go on holidays and they no longer could go to France or go to Spain or go to Italy. So I think they all decided they want to go to Donegal, or at least it felt like that to us on the N4 and 15 site, because the volumes of traffic going through Sligo in them months was really, really significant. 
And this was probably the most difficult period during the works because we were experiencing delays from 30 minutes right up to 50 minutes. And because we were locked in uh, with our traffic management measures, basically we had a large hole at the N4 and uh, N16 junction for the provision of the Copper River culvert. So we were very limited what mitigation we could provide at that stage. In terms of the second lockdown in early 2021, the N4 and 15 was actually deemed critical transport utility infrastructure due to its strategic location adjacent and, and proximity to the hospital. And indeed, because key third party utility diversions had already been uh, phased and programmed for. So the site was allowed to remain open during the second lockdown in January 2021. And again, this then saw a dramatic decrease in traffic volumes going through the site. However, this one's once again short lived as from April 2021 onwards, the HSC put in a vaccination centre based in Sligo IT, which is now the Atlantic Technological University, which once again saw traffic volume significantly rise with people uh, all having to pass through the N4 and 15 site in order to uh, attend at the uh, vaccination centre. So significant consultations were required between the, the RE staff, the client, the contractor, and indeed uh, with the HSC and Gardaí itself to uh, ensure that sufficient signage and notification was provided to the public passing through the works and to make them aware of delays because the vaccination centre was working on a, a you know, come in time principle so that they didn't want people coming in advance because it would block up the car park and they didn't want people delayed because that would throw their whole programme out as kilter. So then moving on to in relation to utilities and drainage, you know, this was an urban site. So we had, you know, issues in terms of unforeseen uncharted services, including, you know, uncharted services and sewers from uh, residential properties. We had a particular difficulty with concrete surrounds at known utility infrastructure. So while we knew they were there, just so, some of the concrete surrounds was really, really problematic in terms of access into these utilities and diversion of same. We had a, a particular issue in terms of twin existing sewer rising main at the N15 or 291 junction, which resulted in a significant uh, redesign of the surface water drainage of this network. And this arose um, uh, totally unexpectedly because as builds had been consulted, slit, slit trenching had been carried out and it was, just, it was just over a short section where it resulted in a significant clash. And we also had a number of clashes with old stone sewer culverts. In terms of diversion of the existing utilities, you know, as I said earlier under phase three, we had significant third party uh, utility infrastructure and assets underground as part of this site. In terms of air, we were talking about the strategic line between Sligo and Letterkenny. You know, we're talking up to nine way ducts, cram packed with copper and fiber cables. So significant coordination was required between the contractor and indeed air in terms of all these relocations. And AIR did confirm to us that this site was probably one of the most complicated sites they've ever been involved with in terms of diversions for roadworks. In particular, if we just take a look at two photos. So you'll see here, this is the junction of the N4 and N16, and you can just see it's a maze of services. You know, you're treading the eye of the needle here in terms of trying to put services in on site. And the photo on the right, you'll see is the existing AIR chamber, which was to be retained but I don't think it's fair to call it a chamber. It's more like an underground vault because the room below is approximately three meters by three meters squared, a mass of cables. And if you look closely, you will see the reflection of the person taking the photo because all these chambers were also tidal, just providing another layer of complexity in terms of the versions that were required. We also had significant ESB underground medium voltage cables and indeed overhead cables to be dealt with at the N15 or 291 junction. ENESH and Sligo have a metropolitan area network, so they provide uh, freight fibre to different carriers who also have clients who are really, really significant multinational companies. So the stage, staging and diversion of these was had to be carried out at night under, uh, under a real uh, significant advance notification provided for same. We also had CSIRO on site. Now CSIRO is a collaboration between ESB and uh, Vodafone. And this was not picked up as part of the preliminary design in phase three because the CSIRO cables were actually running through the ESB existing ducts. So once we identified this on site, we actually had to provide additional separate infrastructure for CSIRO. Uh, we also had virgin assets on site and indeed Irish water assets. So in terms of earthworks, look, this was not an earthwork scheme. Uh, there was no major cuts or fills. But the difficulty with the earthworks on this scheme was that it was very piecemeal in nature. You know, it was very, very hard for the contractor to open up any significant extensive road 
because we had to keep traffic live on the road at the same time. So this had an impact on the availability of sectoral material to be one on site for reuse elsewhere on site. We also encountered an additional hard material layer, which consists of an old concrete road base layer in certain locations of the site. And this required the contractor to break it out with a smaller rock breaker. And the contractor elected to process this hard material into suitable material using a crusher. So this saved disposal of the hard material and also uh, minimized the import of virgin aggregates onto the site. So in relation to new Irish water capital infrastructure, so during phase five, Sligo County Council entered into a state body agreement with Irish Water for, for the provision of some new Irish water capital infrastructure. And this infrastructure was provided so as to save Irish Water having to carry significant earthworks and uh, intrusive works to the N4 and 15 in the future. So it consists of two number 600 millimeter diameter trunk sewer sleeves crossing the N15. So this would allow for the future upgrade of the existing sewer running at that location. It also provided a strategic water main link between the N4 and 16 junction and Ballas Quay, again, to provide additional resilience and capacity uh, north south over the river. But probably most importantly of all, it provided an extension of the existing twin rising mains from the N15 R291 junction up to Ballas Quay. So Irish Water have an existing pump station located approximately one and a half kilometers north of site at the N15 Thiessen. And this has its own wastewater catchment. But Irish Water were also looking to provide uh, sewage upgrade works to the townlands of Ross's Point, to Ballancar and Craigs. And their intention was to pump the wastewater from Ross's Point into the pump station at Thiessen and in turn to have it pumped from the pump station at Thiessen over to the wastewater treatment plant, which is located on the southern side of Sligo Bay. However, the catch for them was that the siphon under Sligo Bay, to which the pumping station was uh, um, ultimately discharging prior to the N415 works, had capacity issues and would not take all of the effluent that would, and wastewater that would be coming from Ross's Point. So by us providing the extension to the twin rising mains, this allowed Irish Water to significantly advance the uh, wastewater scheme for Ross's Point, and indeed the contract for same was signed earlier this year. In terms of existing Irish water infrastructure, we were required to divert 450, uh, the 450 millimeter combined sewer structure 02 so as to facilitate the construction of that retaining wall, and this diversion was about 100 meters in length. We also had to uh, carry out a number of repair of the damaged combined pipe sewers and stone culvert sewers some of which was identified prior to the, the works commencing and some during the works. And we also had to carry out replacement of some existing manhole chambers, which were determined to be defective uh, while the works were ongoing. So moving on to the Copper River culvert and the construction of same. So the Copper River culvert is structure 04 and works the same commenced in May 2020 when the site reopened after the first COVID lockdown. So this consists of works of installation of a sheet pile copper dam, both upstream and downstream. The contractor then carried out a partial excavation of the twin corrugated pipes, which then allowed him to carry out the first lift of the precast U units on the upstream side. He then carried out the construction of a temporary access road for northbound traffic, and then this allowed the diversion of N15 southbound traffic. So if we just look at the photo, we'll see we have the sheet pile copper dam on the north on the upstream side of the um, the culvert here, we have the downstream sheet pile dam. We have the first lift already in place with the northbound uh, lane diverged onto temporary access road. And indeed N15 southbound traffic are diverged along the old Bundoran road, Ballytibnan road at this location and down along the N16 Duck Street and away to N4. You will also note that the upstream face of the Copper River uh, Masonry Arts section bridge is exposed. So a moment ago, I was mentioning about COVID and how we got seven weeks of glorious weather and the earthwork season had come early. Well, that weather continued right up until early July. And then the heavens opened. And being the west of Ireland, it didn't really stop because we started getting consistent heavy rainfall and Atlantic fronts moving in at, at extreme regularity, more so than would be normal for uh, summer conditions. So this resulted in... Um, the River Bonnet, which is the upstream section of the uh, Loch Gill and Garavog catchment going into flood, in turn sending floodwaters into Loch Gill and Loch Gill in turn rising. And Loch Gill's outfall is actually controlled by a weir and gates on the Garavog at Riverside. So well, why is this important? 
Well, because the Copper River, the source of same, is located in alluvial wet woodland on the shores of Loch Gill. And ordinarily in summer months, there's very, very little water flowing from Loch Gill into the Copper River. However, with Loch Gill uh, water levels elevated for the time of year, the Copper River started acting as an overflow. So water started backing up behind the upstream dam, and so much so that it, there was a risk of flooding of the N16 Ash Lane and IT Sligo. So the contractor brought in additional pumps to try and see could he deal with the water, but ultimately he had no option but to pull the sheet piles to release the water. And going back through the uh, RE records, we can see that there was 43 days lost between July and mid-September in relation to flooding of the work zone for Structure 04. So obviously this had a significant impact on programme and indeed on traffic management measures on site because the N15 southbound diversion had to remain in play until Structure 04 was completed. In relation to the buried upstream face of the masonry art structure, so when that was exposed, we realised there was additional repair works over and above those uh, included in the works requirements that would be needed to be carried out. And with the construction sequence in terms of working from upstream to downstream, there was an assumption by the public and indeed the media that the masonry art section of the bridge was going to be demolished. So we received numerous representations um, to preserve the bridge, and it caused you know, a significant bit of consternation that you know, such a fine structure would be demolished by the works. So we ultimately had to issue a press release to assure the public that the bridge was always in our plans to be repaired and indeed retained. And I think if we cast our minds back to the bridge option appraisal, you know, we would have been in some trouble if the actual option had been to actually demolish the full structure in the first place. So in terms of additional works themselves were required to the upstream phase, we had to consult with the TI structure section in terms of the additional repair works. And ultimately, it was decided that we carry out underpinning and the provision of an in situ concrete structural vertical slab. We were also going to provide mass concrete baffles on each side of the arches, both to protect the structure and also to provide deflection for flows into the narrower openings of the masonry arch bridge. And as per the works requirements, we were also carrying out repair of masonry repointing and the provision of a steel culvert screen on the upstream side of the structure. So just looking at the repairs that need to be carried out in more detail, and we see the image on the left, we have our precast units dropped into place. We have a void in the stonework on the left hand side. So when I mentioned earlier, the downstream facade of the bridge is extensive stonework on each side. Ultimately, we did not have that on this case, which was, you know, which was unexpected. We also had additional repairs required to where the central wall of the upstream chamber was tied into the masonry arch structure, and we'd also avoid on the right. And on the right, we have the finished uh, works. So we have our in situ vertical slab, which forms part of the in situ tie-in between the masonry art section and the precast elements. We have our repairs carried out and our repointing carried out to the masonry upstream face. And we have our mass concrete bottles at each side. So as well as structure 04, we other, also had six other retaining walls. So three of the retaining walls were relatively minor in nature, but retaining wall structures 01 to 03 were quite significant in their own right. Retaining wall structure 01, which was constructed along the foreshore, was 67 and a half metres in length, required approximately 320 cubic metres of structural concrete and had a max retained height of 4.3 metres, plus an additional 1.4 metre high stone clad pyramid. Retaining wall structure 02 was 87 metres in length, a max retained height of 3.4 metres, plus an additional 1.4 metre high stone clad parapet, and indeed re uh, required 300 cubic metres of concrete. Likewise, retaining wall structure 03, which was constructed along the HSC property, 68 metres of length and a max height of 3.15 metres and a requirement of 200 cubic metres of structural concrete. So all significant structures in their own right. So then in terms of surfacing, the Wearing course to be installed originally on this site was hot rolled asphalt, and this was to provide root consistency between the pavement to both the north and south of the scheme. However, as traffic management plans were being drawn up for the surfacing, there was significant impl implications on the use of HRA for traffic management. And this was a result of the need to provide uh, pre-coated chippings onto the mat via a chipper. So the chipper is approximately five to five and a half meters in length and would take up uh, over two lanes. So significant multiple diversions will be required to facilitate the HRA surfacing. So the contractor was asked to consider nighttime working for the surfacing. And leaving aside the contractual implications the same, the contractor went back to his subcontractor to see what nighttime workings could be achieved. 
However, only limited nighttime working was available because quarries and indeed astral batching plants, when they are renewing their planning conditions, they sometimes get uh, uh, operating hour conditions assigned to that planning consent. So in terms of nighttime works, that was out of the question in terms of Sligo region as a whole, as a lot of the plants around Sligo have all these same limitations in terms of nighttime operations. So we're at something of an impasse. So the contractor then submitted a value engineering proposal to provide uh, SMA in lieu of the HRA, that this will be laid uh, after the PM peak at uh, six o'clock in the evening until approximately half 11, but with all materials being delivered to site and being manufactured in accordance with the batch and plans planning permission. But more importantly, that the material will be laid in echelon in order to maximize productivity on the site. So those who aren't familiar with, with what I mean by laid in echelon, just a short video to show same. So by laying an echelon, what we mean is that we've got two or more pavers laying side by side. And basically the material, the full three lanes are being pulled at the one time by the two pavers. So there is no longitude of the joint. The joint has been hot matched. So this provides benefits in terms of durability. So you can see here the one paver pulling two lane widths and then the second paver slightly ahead which is pulling the third lane. And you can see in the distance, you can see all the loads of material that has been uh, arrived on site for that evening. Um, and this indeed was the northbound lanes and you can see the southbound traffic has actually been diverted and the northbound traffic has actually been pushed over into the southbound lanes. So then moving on to the urban traffic control system in terms of the construction and implementation of same. So the UT system provided by the by traffic solutions as the UT specialist is Siemens urban traffic control system incorporating Scoot MMX. And Scoot MMX is an adaptive signal control algorithm which monitors traffic flows in real time to optimize traffic signal operation and adjust signal timings to match prevailing conditions. So all vehicles are detected on all approaches to each junction with lane occupancy being measured every quarter of a second. This in turn creates a profile for each link, which the UTC model uses to predict queue behavior at each stop line, which is then used in the optimization of the overall network. The UTC model also predicts delays and buildup of congestion as part of its overall analysis. And the Siemens UTC UX system has the capability to control up to 500 intersections. Now for the N4 and 15 works, we required only a license for up to 100 nodes. And when you consider that we wanted only initially at 13 locations, I think we have more than future-proof the scheme for Sligo. Um, the UTC server and associate software itself is located in City Hall. And the scheme also includes the provision of dedicated fiber option termination cabinets, which sit alongside the traffic signal control cabinets at each junction location. And the reason for the separate fiber optic termination cabinets is to allow other applicants and other applications to use the fiber optic network without having to interfere with the traffic signal hardware in the controllers themselves. Prior to award of the contract and following consultation with Sligo County Council's IT department, we actually uh, upgraded the specification for the fiber optic cable from 28 core to 192 core. So this was to provide additional capacity in the fiber, op net fiber optic network and to be consistent with Sligo County Council's Smart City Initiative. And the funding associated with SAME for that change order was fully um, met by Sligo County Council. Access into the server itself is provided remotely over the internet and the UTC server is not linked to Sligo County Council's uh, corporate IT network. Uh, obviously, Traffic Solutions as a third party uh, cannot be able to access Sligo County Council's nor, nor, uh, corporate network, but does require full access into the UTC server. So just to look at the software in terms of the UTC UX Sligo system summary. So we can see here we have interactive mapping showing all the locations of the traffic signal controllers which form part of the UTC system. And we also have you know, a graphical display of the controllers and whatever faults. So this system summary allows us to quickly assess any active faults, calm faults, sites offline, lamp faults, etc. We were also able to drill into the individual junctions themselves and the controllers at them junctions. So the status monitor, again, it shows us through graphical representation, the cycle times, the demands, the stage histories, etc all real-time data that allows the operator to see what's going on on a second-by-second -second basis out on site. 
And the system also allows us to access historical data through its Astrid, Astrid database. So Astrid is a database that collects and stores uh, information used and produced by the overall Scoot and UTC model. So we're talking here data such as congestion, traffic flows, stage lengths, and saturation, which are all collected, processed, and stored by the system. And if we just look at the image on the screen here, we're, we're dealing with the N4, N16 Duck Street Junction at this location here. And the graph here is plotting the vehicle flow per hour against uh, different days of the week. And this the time period in question is 27 to September 2020 to the 3rd of October. So just very, very recently. So if we look at the graph, we can see that the AM peak starts here at approximately 8.15, 8.20 in the morning and rises sharply at the N416 junction to, uh, and peaks at 8.52. We then see a dramatic fall off in traffic volumes and then a steady buildup right throughout the day to the lunchtime interpeak, and then pretty consistent right throughout the afternoon before dropping away before six o'clock. We then have a further peak in around eight o'clock, and we believe this further peak at eight o'clock is to do with a shift change in Sligo University Hospital. But the interesting thing that I take out from this graph is that while we have a very, very distinct AM peak, we do not have a corresponding distinct PM peak here at this junction. So in terms of the installation of this urban traffic control system itself, the Associated Civil Works commenced in March 2021 when the main civil works on the main area of at Hughes Bridge to the N15 were complete. The installation of the UTC fibre optic network commenced in May 2021, and the installation of the commission of the UTC system itself commenced in July 2021 after the SMA servicing was completed. Just want to very briefly touch on the road safety audit stage three. So it was completed in August, 2021, and there was a number of issue, issues identified in terms of uh, sign and lining, and these were quite minor in nature, easily accepted and dealt with. But there was two issues which are, I believe could be relevant to people on the, on the uh, talk tonight, because they may have similar issues elsewhere on other schemes around the country. So the first one is in relation to pedestrian guardrails at the staggered crossings and the median. So this scheme was designed to demurs, and demurs will tell you that it does not favour the use of pedestrian guardrails as it inhibits uh, the movement of pedestrians, which is you know, contrary to demurs itself. However, the audit team had a particular issue here on the staggered crossings in the median. Uh, they were afraid of walkthrough, so they were afraid of possibly uh, young kids running through into live traffic lanes. And they were also concerned about uh, visually impaired persons and how they'd find the other crossing point. So a number of solutions were considered, including the use of low planter boxes. However, for maintenance reasons, these were discounted. So we ultimately had to revert to short, discrete sections of a pedestrian guardrail to prevent the walkthrough and indeed to assist visually impaired persons. The second issue then was in relation to the use of uh, the splitter islands and tactile uh, paving uh, on same. So initially, the splitter islands were poured with um, uh, were poured of concrete and they had three crossing points with the red blister paving. And you can see they're triangular in shape. There's four splitter islands in total on this site, two at the N4 and 16 junction and two at the Marquis Road junction. And these facilitate left slips in and out of these junctions. And the concern by the audit team here was that it'd be very, very difficult for again, visually impaired persons to navigate their way to the other crossing point on the splitter island. So, in consultation with Jacobs, who had been doing some similar work on other schemes, including Bus Connects, we implemented uh, and requested the contractor um, to install guidance tactile paving. So we can see here there's guidance tactile paving provided from the crossing point to a central node, which is formed out of buff blister paving. And so visually impaired persons can follow the line of the guidance tactile paving to this node and then find the other crossings using the other guidance tactile um, measures. So this was something new for me. I'd never seen it before, and hopefully it may offer a solution to other persons on similar schemes around the country. So just in terms of contract duration and outturn, the contract date was the 31st of July, 2019. The contract type was the public, uh, PWCF3, Public Works Contract for Civil Engineering Works Designed by the Employer. Construction commenced in September, 2019. And the date of substantial completion was the 10th of September, 2021. There is a two year defects period and the overall outturn total scheme costs was circa 15 million euro. So the scheme is currently in phase seven, closeout and review, and the defects period ends in September, 2023. 
Snagging and rectification of minor defects is well advanced. Uh, there are some minor defects still to be closed out, but uh, we expect that to be done very, very shortly. And the safety file is being reviewed. Uh, close out report for TI is currently being prepared. And just to, to finish, I just want to show a video of the completed works. And this actually uh, consists of two videos, one from uh, October 2021 going southbound and then uh, one from a couple of weeks ago uh, going northbound. And I'd actually like to thank Fox's uh, Building Engineering Limited, especially Michael Kelly and Conor McGurr, for permission to use these videos. And, you know, again, they especially flew the video, uh, the drone a few weeks ago, uh, especially for tonight. So, again, I'd like to thank them for same. Okay, so we're here looking north from just above the N15 North 291 junction and we're rotating around and now we're going to travel southbound through the works. So you'll see on the right hand side that we have segregated cycle facilities and footpath facilities along the western side. And you'll see likewise in a few moments we'll have the development of same along the left hand side. So again, now we're approaching the N15 North 291 junction, which is completed. And we'll see that we have our attenuation treatment pond in on the left hand side. And we'll now pan round uh, towards the R291 junction. And again, in the foreground now is the development of a small urban park, which is developed as part of the scheme. Just again in the foreground there, we have a new apartment block, which was built by Sligo County Council's housing development. So there was particular uh, and significant interaction with the housing department in relation to the boundary finishes there as part of the scheme also. You can see then the compound that was used for the works as part of the scheme. And there was significant setback of existing boundaries along the R291. So moving from the R291 now back onto the N15, you'll see now the completed Copper River structure and in front of you. So again, looks totally different from what from the video that I was shown from July 2020. If you look very, very carefully, it's, uh, you'll just take a glimpse of the actual steel screen. Uh, at this location just here, the actual culvert screen, which prevents debris. And you can see there's actually some debris on it, so it's doing its job. And now we're moving and approaching the N4 and 16. And just this video was taken from October. So you can see the splitter islands in front of us, and there's actually no uh, tactile guidance paving on them at this stage. We can see now on the N16 junction that the cycle facilities are on road. And then moving further south, you'll see that there is still segregated cycle facilities on the right-hand side but that on the left-hand side, because of land constraints and limited widths, we actually had to provide a shared cycleway footway. And the pinch point for the HSC was just, as you can see, the kink in the wall here. Um, so we had to ensure that that internal access road was kept for the HSC to allow them to, to continue to operate. Now moving towards the N4 Marquis Road Junction, and we can see that there was significant widening in onto Salmon Point. <clears throat> And again, now looking back south over Hughes's Bridge. Okay, so just, um, we'll now move to the video that was taken just a couple of weeks ago. So again, moving northbound on approach, we'll see that the grass verges now are well established. Uh, additional line marking had been provided and so, so this is additional line marking uh, required by the road safety audit stage three. If you look closely now at the splitter islands, you see that the guidance tactile paving in buff color has been installed. And if you look very, very closely on the left hand side, you will see that a percent for art feature has also been installed. So the uh, a contribution from the scheme was combined with a, a contribution from the adjacent housing development, which was provided to the arts office, who went out and uh, provided the percent for art uh, sculpture for the uh, actual project itself. And so we come to the tie-in, and this is the new pedestrian crossing point that was provided as part of the scheme. Okay, so just in relation to key stakeholders, so the sponsoring agency or the employer was Sligo County Council. The sanctioned authority was the Government and Transport Infrastructure Ireland. Employer's representative and designer was Jacobs Engineering Ireland. 
The site or reaching was provided by Sligo County Council. The main contractor, Fox Building and Civil Engineering Limited, trading as Fox Contracts. And just some other notable funding authorities. So the vast majority of the scheme was funded by TAI, but Irish Water did uh, fund the new Irish Water Capital Works that was installed as part of the contract. The National Transport Agency provided funding for the provision of the UTC on the five non-national road junctions. And Sligo County Council directly funded the change order for the upgrade of the fibre optic cable from 28 core to 192 core. And that's me, so thank you. So thank you very much, Kevin, for that uh, really, uh, really inter interesting um, the, the, the talk. It's just very, you can see the, the constraints uh, that, um, you know, the land constraints, the funding constraints, uh, geographical constraints. So there's a lot of um, a lot, lot of challenges there. And I think, yeah, I think it was a very, um, uh, very interesting lecture. Um, how you delivered it. So thank you for that. So uh, the next part, um, we're going to have a, a Q and A session. So uh, for this, I'm going to hand hand you over to uh, Roy O'Connor from the Roads and Transport Society. Uh, sorry, the Roads and Transportation Society. So, uh, Roy, over to you. Thank you. Ian, thanks very much, and uh, good evening, everyone. Kevin, thank you very much. That was a, a very detailed um, uh, insight into what looks like a, a comprehensive project delivered there in Sligo Town. I know we had a chat earlier on about a few of the other activities that were going on associated with it. So um, if anyone wants to ask a question, please put it into the Q&A uh, box there and um, we can talk it through with Kevin, but maybe well, I'm just waiting for that. I can uh, throw a question or two at you myself, Kevin, and, uh, and use my privilege of being on mic. Um, I was just noticing there the Copper River seemed like quite a a significant part of the whole project and the yeah. environmental aspects around making sure that that river can keep it um keep keep the flow going with, with regards to of course the floodwaters that you're saying came down during the torrential rain but i'm assuming that there was a lot to do with the environmental considerations around the you know the water framework directive and the, the the life of the river and you've mentioned about the surface water management doing the construction being quite a significant aspect of it could you tell us was that a, how much of a challenge was that on the environmental side to manage the surface water during construction? Yeah, well, like we, were, we were obliged. Um, sorry, just check. I'm not on mute. No, I'm not. Um, we were obliged uh, as part of one of the conditions of the statutory consent to have an environmental assurance officer to oversee all aspects of the construction, including works alongside the water courses. And the contractor themselves had appointed a site ecologist, and that was a requirement of the works requirements themselves. So there was curtain silt fencing uh, put along all the water courses and indeed along by the sea. Uh, so and to prevent any silt laden runoff entering into the rivers themselves. Um, in terms of surface water, in terms of earthworks, these were diverted to actually the attenuation treatment pond. So for settlement prior to discharge with the overpumping. And likewise, when there was flooding of the works themselves, you know, as I alluded to in the presentation, dewatering of the actual flooded work zone um, you know, when the dams were, the piles were redriven, uh, that in turn was was in via the attenuation treatment pond to allow settlement and then across in uh, on the downstream side through a filter bed uh, before discharge to the sea. And all these measures were overseen both by the contractor site ecologist and indeed our own environmental assurance officer. Um, there was weekly water quality samples taken in the Copper River uh, and, and, and indeed turbidity checks. So and like they were all strict requirements of the contract and the contractor was very, very diligent and uh, in implying those. So, uh, you know, we were very, very satisfied with the mitigation measures and the controls that were in action on site in that regard in terms of surface water. Question there from Sean, was the design subject to a quality audit in accordance with DMORS? And if so, what did it say about the splitter islands and the consequent loss of convenience for pedestrians? So far, yeah. uh, part of that. What did it say about the last priority for cyclists through the scheme as well? So was that option aired out, I suppose, Sean, is what you're um, yeah. asking? Look, I suppose we have to be, this is the main arterial route into and out of Sligo. You know, we are obliged uh, to be compliant with DMERS and we did our very best, you know, in terms of standards. But at the end of the day, we also have to be cognizant of the traffic capacity issues through the site. So it was really a balance, you know, uh, between all, between all, um, in terms of splitter islands, I fully accept, yeah, pedestrians don't like splitter islands, um, but in order to provide the capacity, and the, the, this section of road really is key uh, to the whole of Sligo County, uh, Sligo Town's congestion issues. If we don't get traffic away through this section of road, 
the whole town can quickly block up. Um, so in terms of quality audit, um, I'd have to go back to the consultants in terms of that, to be honest. I can't, can't say one way or the other here tonight. Um, but yeah, look, the, the, the splitter islands and pedestrians are, are never that favoured, but, you know, it's, again, it's a balance, really. It's a balance between all. Similar story to a town of the south of you there, I guess, in recent days. Um, maybe just in terms of the, the efficiency and the effectiveness of the project, um, I, I'm not sure if I missed it there in terms of the, the daily traffic, the average daily traffic um, numbers. Were you able to assess what has changed in terms of the efficiency of the project? I know you have your UTC system in place now, but did you have some sort of a, a traffic count system in place for that road prior to the construction of the project so that you no. can compare before and after? No, we've uh, the twenty six thousand was the approximate uh, value of the ADT um, at the N four and sixteen junction. We actually the roads authority actually have counters out on the town at this moment, um, because we actually have noticed a significant increase in traffic over the last few weeks and months. Um, you know, not not alone in Sligo, but on the approach, the dual carriageway approaches from Cluny, it's very very evident in the morning. And you know, IT Sligo, the Atlantic Technological University, is now back in full spring. It's all based on site, and. We think there's a particular phenomenon because like in, like everywhere else in the country, accommodation works in Sligo is at an absolute premium. Premium, So students are actually finding it very, very hard to get accommodation in Sligo. So we're anecdotally hearing that a lot of students in the general Sligo County area are actually traveling via car every day now into the Atlantic Technological University instead of the traditional pattern of staying down in Sligo itself. And so this... Like it's anecdotal information, but you know it, it tallies up with what we're seeing on the ground. You know, in the mornings, in terms of the UTC system itself, you know, I've been talking to the roads department and indeed to Traffic Solutions, who is the maintenance operator. Um, we're very, very happy with the system because you know it's not a panacea for all ills. It's not going to prevent uh, traffic congestion, but what it does do, it works really, really well in adapting and clearing out that traffic congestion as quickly as possible. And we're seeing that. So where once we used to get traffic congestion that could go on for 45 minutes, 45, 50 minutes, an hour in the mornings, it's like it's a very sharp peak, as I would have shown a few minutes ago. It's It rises quickly, but drops quickly as the UTC system comes in and adapts. Thanks for that, Kevin. And the technology, Sean McGrath, asked that first question. Michael Kelly has a scheme improved traffic congestion. I think we just touched on that. Uh, Declan Kenny, did you have a dust and noise issue as well? Processing the old concrete and road surface. No, we didn't. We didn't have a dust and uh, noise. Um, you know, it's the construction works on site were noise by nature. Anyway, there was noise receptors provided at the HC facilities. We're actually lucky in a way because the residential properties are actually to the north of the site. You know, and you know there was no. Um, there's. There's no residential properties where the, the crusher was located halfway down on an area ground. So it was actually well separated away from, you know, there was a, there was a buffer there. Um, so no, we actually didn't have any real complaints in terms of that. Possibly when we're doing works at night, you know, there, there was some works uh, done in terms of third party utility cross or third, third, um, mm. third of service crossings done at the N15 or 291 junction. And there was a number of, of complaints in relation to noise that was carried out at night, which, which is understandable, you know. Um, because you know when you're using, yeah, you know, cutting yeah, pneumatic tools at that late night, and especially on a still night, it, it will carry the sound will carry distance, and especially with the water beside us, uh, sound has a tendency to carry. So, I suppose I'm more familiar with urban works and noise, uh, but there I suppose you're right beside uh, um, the coast. And was there any environmental, I suppose, conditions on the the air and noise with regards to? I don't know, local wildlife and so forth, not to push the question. No, much, the, but... the, there was there was limits included in the in the contract in terms of noise and vibration. Okay. You know, these were standard limits that were prioritized as part yeah. of Appendix 1-7, you know, with limitations on site use. So, you know, I, I don't think we had any issues in terms of exceeding the same. Um, again, there, Michael, uh, Kelly is just asking about lessons learned, and I, I know you're at the, the closeout stage at the moment, so I suppose... Um, what are the key um, lessons you might have learned from the project? What would you not do or what would you ensure you did earlier um, if you were to run the project again, Kevin? Um, yeah, I probably, look, I think I think our overall, our forecasted duration for the works was probably on the optimistic side. You know, initially there was 12 months for the works. Um, you know, in hindsight, you know, I think, you know, all, these works and uh, the urban nature of them, like they really, really are slow. They're piecemeal in nature. 
So look, we'd probably look at, you know, extending the duration of the works to possibly 15, 16, possibly even 17 months. You know, like we had delays associated with COVID. The site was closed for seven weeks, but in reality, the closure was much, for COVID was much, much longer than that, you know. Um, so I suppose that was the one big lesson learned uh, for myself personally. Um, you know, in terms of earthworks operations, you know, earthworks wasn't a major issue on site. You know, I, I, our design really looked at, you know, reusing existing acceptable material on site, which is the correct thing to do uh, and to, to use all site one material. However, it's very hard to win that site material in the timely fa fashion on an urban site like that. So, you know, maybe a different earthwork strategy uh, may be more beneficial to everyone in the long run. Kevin, well done to you and the team there in Sligo, your contractors and so forth, all acknowledged. Um, I think we've gone through all the questions there. And to be fair, you've, uh, you've uh, given us an hour and a half or more of a uh, conversation there since I met you earlier this evening. So uh, thank you very much for that. I'm sure everybody is very appreciative of the effort and time you put into preparing that for us all. And I just like on behalf of the Roads and Transportation Society, I'd like to thank Ian and uh, his colleagues there in the Northwest Region Committee. We appreciate the invitation to co-host with you guys. And um, and uh, thank you. No doubt we'll, we'll, we'll try and run a feature again in the near future with you, with you all. So thanks very much.